And tomorrow, these two guys are becoming Eastons. So uh, they're, they're, the adoption will be official. So, um, so big transitions going on in the Easton clan. Um, and we're, we're thankful to God for all that he's doing in their lives and all that he will do. So let's, let's pray. Lord God Almighty, we, um, we thank you for Keith and Teresa and their faithful gospel ministry over the years. And we pray that you would just continue to work in and through them. We pray that you would use them as instrument, instruments in your hands uh, in Arkansas, that uh, words of life and truth would flow from their lips and, and be a blessing to others. Uh, we thank you for their friendship over the years, and while it's hard to see them go, uh, we, we rejoice that, uh, that you have your people uh, all over this globe, and we trust that you will uh, enable them to persevere in faithfulness to you. We thank you for Greg and Vlad and the way in which you have providentially brought them into the lives of Keith and Teresa. And we rejoice that tomorrow that they will be officially part of the, the Eastern family. And we pray that that uh, you would take the, the gospel that's being sown in their hearts and, and bring them into uh, your big family, Lord. And uh, Lord, uh, we, we thank you for this family and we just, we just pray your blessing upon them as they depart from us and, uh, and travel to Arkansas. We pray that you would uh, protect them as they travel and, uh, and that you would be glorified in this transition. In Jesus' name. <laughs> well, you can turn in your Bibles to the Gospel of John. We, if you're visiting with us, we're working our way through the Gospel of John, and uh, we find ourselves at the end of the, we finished what's considered the prologue of the Gospel of John, the introduction, um, and we're moving on to the more kind of narrative story section of the Gospel of John, so uh, we're working our way, we start at the beginning of a book and work our way until we get to the end of that book of the Bible. So I'm going to read for you uh, John chapter 1, verse 19 to 28. John chapter 1, verse 19 to 28. This is the testimony of John when the Jews sent to him priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? And he confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. They asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? And he said, I'm not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. And they said to him, who are you so that we may give an answer to those who sent us? What do you say about yourself? He said, I am a voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as Isaiah the prophet said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him and said to him, Why then are you baptizing if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but among you stands one whom you do not know. It is he who comes after me, the thong of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. These things took place in Bethany, beyond the Jordan, where John was baptizing. This is God's holy word. Let's ask him for help. Lord God Almighty, we come before you this morning. These are ancient words, thousands of years old. 
and yet they are as contemporary as today's newspaper because you are a God who does not change. Man's nature has not changed. Your truth does not change. And the same Lord Jesus who walked upon this earth, died, rose from the dead, and ascended and sits at the right hand of the majesty on high and is here spiritually present with us this morning as he accompanies his voice in your word. And so, Lord Jesus, do your work in the hearts of your people through your spirit. Also do your work in the hearts of those who are not your people this morning. As we gaze upon the witness of John the Baptist. So Lord, give us a heart of faith. In Jesus' name, amen. A recent survey was done by Lifeway Research Group in which it estimated that 45% of professing evangelical Protestant Christians have talked with somebody who's not a Christian about Jesus in the past six months. So less than half of Christians, at least in the United States of America, have had a conversation about Jesus with somebody who's not a Christian. I'm not sure the last time you talked with somebody about Jesus. I think if you're like most of us, we'd probably say it's not as much as it should be. I can recall a conversation just a couple weeks ago, uh, seeing somebody I hadn't seen since my high school days and realizing I had dropped the ball and had not clearly communicated the gospel with this person. Well, in the Gospel of John, he uses the word witness or testimony some 71 times throughout the Gospel of John. And you remember the purpose and aim of the Gospel of John. He tells us in chapter 20 in verse 30 and 31 that these things have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you might have life in His name. The purpose of John's Gospel is that people would believe and It's no wonder that John records the testimony of John the Baptist because John the Baptist's testimony was so that men might believe. That's what he told us back in chapter 1 in the prologue in verse 6. He says, There came a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. So John the Baptist's aim was to testify about the light so that men might believe. So I think we can safely conclude that the the Apostle John records John's testimony that we might believe. And in our believing, we too might be witnesses. Now, we're not going to be witnesses in the same sense that John the Baptist is a witness. You don't have to you know, change your diet to the latest locust diet, locust weight loss diet, um, or, uh, you know, change your outfit uh, to, to camel's hair or something like that. Um, but we can all, we all ought to be witnesses for Jesus so that people might believe. So my aim is that we would believe John's witness and believe in Jesus and keep believing, follow John in three ways in which he witnesses concerning Jesus this morning. Three ways in which John witnesses. The first is that he gives a straightforward testimony, a straightforward witness. And again, this is on the heels of this this mountaintop introduction to the gospel where Jesus is the Word, He's the one who came and dwelt among us. And now John launches into the the narrative section, the story section of the Gospel of John, and he lays forth John the Baptist's witness, and John gives this straightforward testimony. Verse 19, this is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent to him priests and Levites from Jerusalem and asked him, Who are you? 
And he confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. They asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, No. This is a, a, a kind of deputation that is sent to John the Baptist as an inquiry to ask him questions. Evidently, John's popularity was increasing as we read the other gospel accounts. He, he was an eccentric kind of preacher out in the desert with, as I mentioned, a strange diet and strange outfit. He was a prophet of God. And many people were coming to him to be baptized and his popularity was increasing. And so the, the guardians uh, of the, if you will, the, the truth, in, the ancient, in ancient Israel had to send a deputation to ask John the Baptist, who are you? What is it? What, what is this uh, that you're teaching? Who give, what gives you the right to do what you're doing? And notice this group consists of priests and Levites. They come to Jesus here. Priests, these would have been people who had responsibilities in the temple. They were had all kinds of different responsibilities there in the temple involving sacrifice. The Levites was one of the tribes of ancient Israel, one of those 12 tribes in which the priests were from. And they come asking John questions. Verse 20, John's testimony is that he confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. John wanted to make it clear that he himself was not the Christ. The Christ was the promised anointed one. All throughout the Old Testament, the different offices of pro, uh, prophet, priest, and king, they would uh, often go through this anointing ceremony, but, but, but the people of Israel were waiting for the anointed one, which comes in the Greek language as the Christos, or in Hebrew, the Mashiach, the Messiah. They were waiting for that promised forever king who would rule and reign in righteousness, that promised representative of God, the mediatorial king. John says, I, I'm not him. Verse 21, they ask him, what then? Are you Elijah? Now, you may not be a Bible scholar, but you probably know enough about the Bible to know that isn't Elijah in the Old Testament? Didn't Elijah live many years before John the Baptist? And you would be correct in thinking that. And so this Seems to me like a kind of a strange question. It'd be like somebody saying, are you George Washington? That's a strange question. Are you Elijah? Well, a couple things about Elijah that maybe help us to appreciate this question, that, that it's not totally nonsensical, is first of all, Elijah didn't die, right? He just kind of gets swooped up in a chariot. I mean, that's, that's kind of unique. Um, he gets he, he doesn't die like others on planet earth die and so there's this you know kind of mysteriousness about him as one who didn't die not only that at the end of the closing of the Old Testament one of the post exile prophets Malachi or you might prefer the last Italian prophet Malachi in chapter 4, in verse 5, he says, Behold, I am going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming great and terrible day of the Lord. So a prophet in the Old Testament, Malachi, prophesied that Elijah would be coming before the great and terrible day of the Lord. So now the question makes a little bit more sense. And not only that, we know from the other Gospels that indeed, John the Baptist did come in the spirit of Elijah. But when John says, no, I'm not Elijah, I think what he means is I'm not the actual physical Elijah. I may look like him, I may talk like him, I may have a similar ministry as him, but I'm not Elijah. 
So then they have another question, the second part of verse 21. Are you the prophet? Now, it's important here, notice they don't ask, are you a prophet? He was a prophet, but he was not the prophet. Well, who was the prophet? I never heard of him. Deuteronomy chapter 18 and verse 15, Moses speaks of a prophet that would arise. Deuteronomy 18.15, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your countrymen. You shall listen to him. That phrase, you shall listen to him. That should be, put a little ring in your ears. What does that sound like? Well, it sounds like the transfiguration, right? When the voice from heaven comes, this is my beloved son, listen to him. Jesus was that prophet like Moses. And so when John the Baptist is being inquired, are you the prophet? Are you that prophet, that great spokesman for God who we are to, who we're to be awaiting and looking for? And he says, no, I'm not. Now, I can't help but think that John winks at us here, right? Because what has he just been calling Jesus in chapter 1? In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. Verse 14, the Word became flesh. Verse 18, no one has ever seen God, but God, the only begotten who is in the bosom of the Father, has explained Him. John's already told us who the prophet is. It's the Lord Jesus. And so John is being interrogated here and he's making it clear, I'm not him, I'm not him, I'm not him. In these I am not statements, I think wonderfully contrast with the I am statements of the Gospel of John, right? Because over and over Jesus says things like, before Abraham was born, I am. Unless you believe I am, you will die in your sins. I am the bread of life. I am the resurrection of life. I am the true vine. I am, I am, I am. All throughout the Gospel of John. But here, at, at the very beginning of the Gospel of John, John the Baptist is asked, are you this, are you this? I am not, I am not, I am not. But there is one who is I am. John is very straightforward here in his testimony. He is very clear. He doesn't mince words here. He's not fuzzy. And, and we see that throughout much of the ministry of John the Baptist, right? He's very bold, very clear. Unmistakable. I am not the Christ. I am not Elijah. I am not the prophet. I think as we read this, we, we can learn that our testimony for Jesus should be clear. It should be unmistakable. One of my favorite stories about the evangelist of the Great Awakening, George Whitfield, was one particular morning where he would, he would go and preach at like six in the morning before Farmers were doing their work and thousands would come out to hear him. One particular morning, the skeptical philosopher, David Hume, was coming, was, was in the crowd walking to go listen to George Whitfield preach. And somebody saw Hume in the crowd and they said, what are you doing going to hear Mr. Whitfield preach? You don't believe the same gospel that Mr. Whitfield believes. And he said, you're right. But he believes the gospel. What he meant was, this was a man who believed what he spoke and spoke what he believed. There was something compelling and attractive even to a skeptical philosopher that he wanted to hear a man with convictions speaking forth those convictions without fuzziness. And we can take cues from this, friends. It was 
Martin Luther at the Diet of Worms, who was being interrogated as to whether he wrote these particular writings that he was being charged with heresy for, and they said they wanted him to answer without horns. What they meant without horns was without deceit, without duplicity. Friends, we live in a world where it's increasingly unpopular to testify to Jesus. But you know what? It's really never been that popular. It's just in our culture, we've lived in a bubble of religious freedom for quite some time. And we need to be clear in our testimony about Jesus. It's not a time to be fuzzy. You think the very language of a witness or testifying makes us think of the courtroom. If a lawyer has a witness on the stand and you're trying to convince a jury that somebody has committed murder and here's this eyewitness here and the lawyer goes and asks them a question, uh, is, is the murderer in the room? Can you identify him? Uh, I'm not sure. There's a lot of murderers out there. I mean, I don't want to judge. You don't want a witness like that. That's not very compelling. That's not very clear testimony. That witness is not going to help you get a conviction. In a similar way, when we're testifying about Christ, we want to be clear. And tragically, among so many evangelical leaders today, and the spotlight is on them, the camera is on them. So are you saying that Jesus is the only way to heaven? Well, I think He's the best way to heaven. I mean, and I just want God's best for other people. I mean, is homosexuality a sin? Well, it doesn't produce human flourishing. Friends, that's not helpful. We need to be clear. This is what we believe. This is what the Bible says. This is who Jesus is. Yes, it may put a target on our backs. But we need to be faithful witnesses to Jesus. And friends, this is how the church grows. The historian Adrian von Harnack says, quote, We cannot hesitate to believe that the great mission of Christianity was in reality accomplished by means of informal missionaries. The great mission of Christianity was accomplished by means of informal missionaries. What he's saying there is he's saying everyday people, farmers, merchants, who are faithfully testifying about Jesus to their co-workers, to their neighbors, to their family members. That's how in the early church the gospel spread. It's the same way it's going to spread today. You can't rely upon others to be a faithful witness where, you, where God has you. You know what I mean by that. You're the one who's in the best position to tell your co-workers about Jesus. You're in the best position to tell your family members about Jesus. Yes, others may be able to, as Spurgeon said, may be able to preach the gospel better, but nobody can preach a better gospel. There's no better gospel than the good news of Jesus' death and resurrection. And others may be able to explain it more eloquently, but there's no better gospel 
And if God has opened your eyes to the gospel, you can be a faithful testimony of that gospel where you're at. And those relationships that God has entrusted to you. Tertullian, one of the early church writers, said on the spreading influence of believers, he said, quote, We are but of yesterday. We have filled every place among you. Cities, islands, fortresses, towns, marketplaces, tribes, companies, palace, senate, forum. We have left nothing to you but the temple of your gods. That's quite a statement. We want to disseminate the truth of Christianity by being a faithful witness. John was a faithful witness by a straightforward testimony. We need to be straightforward in our testimony. There's too much of what I would call apologetic apologetics out there. You know what I mean by that? Apologetics is the term for defending the faith. But uh, uh, there is a kind of apologetics that seems to be apologizing that you're a Christian. Oh, I'm sorry that there's these passages in the Old Testament where God kills people. I know that must be so hard for you to believe. No, it's the truth. God is a holy God. He is a God of justice. If he kills somebody, it was right. Let's not apologize. Secondly, his testimony is not only straightforward, it's a shocking testimony. Verse 23. Or verse 22, let's start with. He says, Then they said to him, Who are you so that we may give an answer to those who sent us? What do you say about yourself? Okay, you're not Elijah, you're not the prophet, you're not the Christ. <coughs> but you know what? We, you know, we, we've kind of traveled and people are expecting us to give a report. And you got to give us something here. Verse 23, he said, I am a voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. Make straight the way of the Lord. As Isaiah the prophet said. Now, this is one of those passages that we're so familiar with it that we think we know it. Oh yeah, John, he was in the desert. He's the voice, you know. There's humility in that, you know. He's just a voice. And, and I think part of our familiarity, every, all the Gospels record this about John, is John being the fulfillment of the voice. But sometimes if you're like me, you don't take the time to actually go back and, you know, open that part of your Bible where the pages are still stuck together in Isaiah chapter 40 and see what, what was actually going on then. So I'm going to force you to do that. Turn to Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40. Now, in chapter 39 of Isaiah, that's the account of King Hezekiah, remember? Um, and in... Hezekiah, he was the one who God extended his life for 15 years. But, but with Hezekiah, remember, he, he invited the Babylonians to come and to see the riches, uh, you know, the temple and some of the wealth that was there, which, you know, is, is not a good idea. You know, you don't open your neighborhood, have an open house. At least in my neighborhood, you don't have an open house, okay? Um, because people see things they like. And they say, hmm, that looks good. That would look nice, real nice on my wall. Um, and so Hezekiah foolishly did that with the Babylonians. And then Isaiah prophesied that the people of Israel are going to go into exile because of their disobedience. Okay? And in chapter 40 and on, it's more of a message of hope. That while God's judgment is coming... God's going to do something great in the future in bringing his people back. And so in verse 1, it says, Comfort, O comfort my people, says your God. Speak kindly to Jerusalem and call out to her that her warfare has ended, that her iniquity has been removed, that she has received the, the Lord's hand double 
for all her sins. That while she's guilty, while God's people are guilty, I'm going to remove her iniquity. I'm going to forgive her. I'm going to bring comfort to her. Verse 3. Here's our verse that John quotes. John the Baptist quotes this about himself. A voice is calling. Clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness. Make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. Let every valley be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low and let the rough ground become plain and the rugged terrain a broad valley. Call the civil engineers. We're going to build a road. The valleys are going to be raised up. The mountains are going to be brought low. Well, why would you do such a thing? Well, why would you go have a, a huge civil engineering project? Well, in the ancient world, they did things like this. They did things for one reason. When the king was coming. But notice the next verse, verse 5. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed. And all flesh, notice this very interesting, all flesh, not just Israel, all flesh will see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, call out! Then he answered, what shall I call out? All flesh is grass, and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field, the grass withers, the flower fades. But when the breath of the Lord blows on it, surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. You want to know what to say? God is faithful. Men will die, but God's promise will stand. You can take this promise to the bank. Verse 9. Get yourself up on a high mountain, O Zion, bearer of good news. Go up to the highest point you can. You're going to preach gospel. Lift up your voice mightily. O Jerusalem, bearer of good news, lift it up. Do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. Behold, the Lord God will come with might. His arm ruling for him. Behold, his reward is with him. And he and his recompense before him. Like a shepherd, he will tend his flock. In his arm, he will gather the lambs and carry them in his bosom. He will gently lead the nursing ewes. What do we see here? This voice that's calling out, he's, he's, he's going to be crying out, leading the way for God coming out of the desert. God coming into Jerusalem. God meeting His people. The glory of God will be revealed. And He is going to be like a shepherd caring for His little lambs. In the early church, there was a picture that was common of Jesus with a lamb wrapped around His neck. Clearly a reference to this passage in Isaiah 40. That God is coming. And of course, does John ever talk about shepherds in the Gospel of John? John chapter 10, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. Does John ever talk about the glory being revealed? The Word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld His what? Glory. I would love to go on. If you keep going throughout this chapter, it highlights the transcendence of this great God that, that He sits above the circle of the earth and we're but like a dust in the pan compared with Him. The nations, these great magnificent nations are but like locusts before Him. It's this great passage that we often refer to you know, when we're talking about the attributes of God, the characteristics of God. But John cites this verse saying, this is my job. I'm a voice of one calling in the desert saying, God and His glory is coming to you. This shepherd, this king, he's coming. 
I'm leading the way for him. Now again, if you are the people who are interrogating John, you would have known Isaiah 40. We're not familiar with Isaiah 40. But they would have known it. This would have been like jaw-dropping. You're the voice? That means God in His glory is coming. Now, there was an immediate fulfillment of this with bringing the people of Israel back to the land in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah. But that wasn't its ultimate fulfillment. Remember, after they had gotten the, the foundation of the temple laid in the days of Ezra, remember how the people responded? Half the people, not bad. Half the people, <laughs> It's nothing like the previous temple. And it wasn't. This, the ultimate fulfillment of this is when John the Baptist said it happened. That he was the voice preparing the way for God coming to meet his people. That his people in bareness, in dryness, in spiritual deadness, in a kind of exile away from God, needed to be brought back to God. And this would only happen through the Lord Jesus. That their iniquities needed to be removed. This is a shocking testimony. And it's still a shock today. I mean, you think, the eternal, transcendent God who's the creator of the universe, who as Isaiah 40 says, calls the stars by name, came to this earth born of a virgin, at one point was a little child sitting on his mom's lap, grows up into adulthood, that that could be the eternal God in human flesh? Yesterday I was talking with a couple of Jehovah's Witnesses. The reality of Jesus being God, the same essence as God, in a human body was a pill they were not willing to swallow. A truth they were not willing to believe. It is shocking. And yet it's necessary. Because as I told them yesterday, if you're not believing in the right Jesus, you will stand before this Jesus and I'm pretty sure he won't be happy about you spreading lies about him. Telling everybody he's somebody he's not. And many will say to him on that day, Lord, Lord, but he will say to them, depart from me, I never knew you. Friends, do you believe in this Jesus? This amazing Jesus? The eternal God who's the creator of the universe, who upholds all things by the power of his word, and yet wonder of wonders weds himself to a human nature in the person, the one person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he lives a perfect life on this earth for 33 and a half years, and he goes to the cross as that good shepherd to gather up his lambs, he dies on behalf of his sheep and rises from the dead. Friend, is that your hope to stand before this great God? Or are you trusting in something else? Are you trust in that you're a decent person? You can always find people worse than you. Are you trusting in your baptism, you're trusting in maybe your parents are Christians. Those aren't 
what are going to get you to heaven. You need this great God to work on your behalf through his death and resurrection. And also this should encourage us to testify to give this shocking testimony about Jesus. I understand it might get you in trouble. John got his head separated from his shoulders. It's never good for your health. But it's a saving message. It's a message that's good news. Be willing to speak bold truth of Christianity. Shocking truth. And to speak it without fuzziness. To be that witness in the courtroom to say, yes, this is Jesus. This is who he is. This is what he's done. This is how you must respond. Well, we see his straightforward testimony, his shocking testimony, and now his self-abasing testimony. <coughs> self-abasing, humble testimony. Verse 24. He says, now they had been sent, it says, now they had been sent from the Pharisees. The Pharisees, they were a large uh, lay movement in ancient Israel. They began during the time, uh, what's called the intertestamental period, the period between Malachi and Matthew, during the days of the Maccabees. If you were with us in our study of Daniel some years ago, the Maccabeans, they were the ones who revolted uh, against the, uh, the, the, the uh, Hasmonean dynasty of that day. Um, and, and basically, the Pharisees, they were concerned that the God's people were being influenced by the world. Is that a good concern? Nod your head, yes. They were concerned, okay, that, that the Hellenization of the world, the influence of Greek culture and paganism was influencing God's people. And so this group, Pharisees, means separatists. They, 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 they began to take measures to try to separate themselves from the rest of the world. But over time, what started out as something good became very legalistic. And we see them in the Gospels as basically the, you know, the guys who wear the black hats, the, the enemies of Jesus throughout the Gospels. But they're, they're involved in sending of this deputation to Jesus. Verse 25, they asked him and said to him, Why then... Are you baptizing? If you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet. So they're pursuing this questioning further because John has, has said who he's not. The only thing he said he was was the voice, the voice of Isaiah 40 declaring the coming of God. And so now they're saying, okay, but that's still not clear who you are. What, what gives you the authority to baptize? Now, a little bit about baptism during this time period to help us to understand. Okay, as far as I, I understand, amongst Jews of Jesus' day, there was one kind of baptism that was done, and it was an initiatory baptism when you were Gentile, non-Jewish, and you were converting to the God of Israel, you would undergo this kind of baptism, okay? Uh, also, it was auto-baptistic. What I mean by that, you baptize yourself. Okay? So, there was two things that were very unique about John baptizing. One, he's the one who did the baptism. Two, it was normally for Gentiles becoming Jewish. But here, John is baptizing not Gentiles, right? He's saying, you Jewish people, you, you know, you thought the Gentiles need to wash off their Gentile cooties? You guys got cooties. You need a washing. You guys are sinful. You guys are filthy. You guys need forgiveness. And so that was kind of like a shock. Wait a second. We're God's people. We're dirty. And then on top of that, 
they weren't baptizing themselves. John was baptizing them. And so, the question is, well, who, who do you think you are to do this? What, by what authority do you do this? You're not Elijah. You're not the prophet. You're not the Christ. Why are you baptizing? Again, John is very... Uh, he's not very self-referential. He, he, he says in verse 26, I, it's almost like immediately he wants to get the camera off of him and on to Jesus. He says, I baptize in water, but among you stands one whom you do not know. He said, you got me. I baptize with water, but, but you need to understand, there is among you one whom you do not know. Wow. This is reminiscent of verse 10 of John, chapter 1. Remember how John starts in his prologue, he was in the world, and the world was made through him. And the world did not know him. The world, probably in this context, is referring to the Gentile world, and John the Baptist here is referring it to these Jewish people. I baptize with water, but there is one among you whom you do not know, whom you should be asking questions, whom you should be bowing before. There stands one among you whom you do not know. And this is the tragedy. This is the tragedy of the Gospel of John is that he was in the world. The world was made through him. The world did not know him. He came to his own, but his own did not receive him. That this is the verdict. Light has come into the world. But what? Men love the darkness rather than the light. This is the tragedy of the Gospel of John is by the end of it, the light who has come into the world is stuck on a Roman cross, publicly executed. They knew him not, even though he was in their midst. The one whom he was preparing the way for, the one whom he was declaring as a voice in the wilderness, declared, behold, this is your God. They said, no, nope, not my God. Not my God. Arthur W. Pink comments on this. There's, there stands one among you whom you know not. This, how this exposed Israel's condition, how this revealed their spiritual ignorance, and how tragically true in principle is this today. Even in so-called Christian land, while many have heard about Christ, yet in how many circles, yes, in religious circles too, may, we may say, there stands among you whom you, you know not. Oh, the spiritual blindness of natural man. Christ by His Spirit stands in the midst of many congregations, unseen and unknown. Young people, Jesus is in your midst. He comes to you in your word, in the Word of God regularly through times of family worship. You hear about Him in Sunday school. You hear about Him in the public gathering of God's people. He's in your midst. But you know Him not. Turn to Him. Beg God to open your eyes. Please help me to see Jesus so He's more precious to me than, than an Xbox, than a Nintendo DS. Open my eyes that I can see. Help me to see Jesus more than whatever athletic or sports competition I'm good at.
But John's testimony is indeed a self-abasing testimony. We'll get to that in the next verse. Verse 27, It is he who comes after me, the thong of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. These things took place in Bethany beyond the Jordan while John was baptizing. This almost certainly is not the Bethany that we see later on in the Gospel of John where Mary and Lazarus and Martha live. This is evidently another Bethany because geographically it's impossible to harmonize the two. Notice John's testimony. It is he who comes after me, the thong of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. Amongst the Jewish people, there were certain tasks that servants and disciples could do, but there were certain tasks that were off limits, and they, usually it involved feet, okay, which I think we can appreciate, you know. Feet can be dirty and stinky, uh, especially if you wore sandals in the ancient world and, you know, didn't have covering over your toes. You know, we call stinky foot in our family kachichas, so Filipino term. So if you were a, the rabbis in the ancient world, they, they wouldn't, they didn't get a, a normal pay, but they would have disciples that would basically do everything for them. You know, go get me a coffee, uh, you know, go get me a cheeseburger down the road and, you know, the disciple would go get it. But there was a limitation. He couldn't ask you, that rabbi couldn't ask you to put on his shoes. He couldn't ask you to wash his feet. Same thing when it came to foot washing, which we'll see later on in the Gospel of John. John chapter 13, uh, you know, a servant, a slave, you know, could do just about any task, but the foot washing you couldn't be a male Jew if you're going to do that. Foot washing was reserved only for Gentiles or women. Sorry, ladies. I didn't make that up. It was just the culture of the day. And so when John says here, one who comes after me, there is one whom I am not worthy to unstrap his sandals what John is saying here is that that task that is reserved for the lowest of the lowest of society, I am not worthy to do that for him. I'm not worthy to be a slave. I'm not worthy to be a disciple. He's up here and I'm down here. And this, by the way, is, is, is always true humility. True humility is not a man who stands six foot two acting like he's four foot eight. I'm really this small, you know. Somebody says, oh, that was a wonderful song you blessed us with with your voice this morning. Oh, no, I sound terrible. No, that's not humility. Humility is when we, as six foot two, compare ourselves with the eternal, unchanging, almighty God. We really are small. We don't need to act like we're small. We're small. He's big, okay? And that's what John is doing here. It's a self-abasing testament. <laughs> this is one whom I am not worthy. He's so high. He's so glorious. <laughs> He's the one of Isaiah 40. Behold, your God. I'm not worthy. And friends, this should be our posture as we testify of Jesus as well. You see, I don't know about you, but in my experience... My shrinking back to testify about Jesus is almost always related to my eyes being on myself and not on Jesus. You're going to think I'm weird. You're going to think I'm one of those crazy Jesus people. They're going to make fun of me. But you see, when I remind myself of the Jesus of scriptures who says all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go make disciples. 
Okay. I'm good. He's the king. He's the glorious one. He tells me to do this. I'll do it. But when my eyes are on myself, Scared the cat. Coward. Shrink back. John the Baptist's eyes were on Jesus. His eyes were on the Lord Jesus. And he wanted to present Jesus, to declare Jesus, to be that voice for Jesus. So that men would believe. So that people would bow their knee to Jesus. And while our situation is different, there's a very real sense in which, you know, John, John doesn't survive throughout the gospel. He gets executed. He didn't get to see the end of the story. He didn't get to see Jesus' death. He didn't get to see Jesus' resurrection. We do. We have. We get the full picture. There's a sense in which we probably know more about Jesus than even John the Baptist knew about him. Even though we're not a prophet, but we have more revelation in Scripture than he had. So we can testify of Jesus. Perhaps you've had an experience with a play or some kind of performance where there's curtains hanging there. And there's that one person whose responsibility is to pull the curtain. In a very real sense, that's our job. Just pull the curtain. Let Jesus take center stage. Testify of Him. Let's pray. Lord God Almighty, we know that we don't testify as we ought to. That's why we need what Jesus did on the cross. But Lord, we also want to be encouraged and motivated and inspired to be better witnesses for the Lord Christ. And so Lord, help us in this task with our friendships, our families, our co-workers, our neighbors to lift our voice for the glory of Christ in whose name we pray. Amen.